thank you everyone. So I'm really happy to have our speaker, Shadi, um, give his presentation. So I'll pass it off to you, Shadi. Hey, how you guys doing? Uh, my name is uh, Shadi Daoud, and uh, my presentation is called uh, Water Wheel, which is named after a song by the great Hamza Hamdin, who is uh, the focus of uh, this presentation. So what led me to this? Uh, growing, up, growing up as a Nubian in uh, Giza, Egypt, I always heard uh, Nubian music at social gatherings and weddings, but I never really found interest in it until I started playing music as a teenager and I discovered Hamza Abdin's music. This is the uh, presenter's promise. I am not an expert, but I promise I tried to learn as much as I could to satisfy my curiosity about this topic. Uh, someone here might know more uh, about this topic uh, than me. Uh, please correct me and ask questions, contribute, but do it nicely. I am not trying to persuade you of my agenda or convince you to take action. My only hope is uh, my presentation might cultivate uh, your own curiosity. So my question is, how do I know I'm listening to Hamza Eldin? This is uh, my uh, outline. Uh, for presentation and it starts with uh, who are the Nubians. Then I'll go into who Hamda, Hamza al-Din was. After that, I'll explain uh, what does Nubian music sound like, uh, followed by Hamza's unique style and finally Hamza's uh, legacy. I'd like to play a brief part of this song uh, called A Wish by Hamza al-Din just to... <laughs> group of people who lived um, who live in southern part of uh, Egypt and northern part of Sudan. Our civilization dates back to 7000 BCE. Uh, Nubia in ancient time was called uh, Kingdom of Kush and the Nubians were known as Kushites and they were known to be great archers. Uh, the drawing here is um, in the slide is a drawing of uh, King Pianki who was the first pharaoh of the uh, 25th dynasty. Uh, the painting here also shows the mountain in the back um, over here, which is uh, called uh, Jabal Barkal, which is the northern part of uh, Khartoum, Sudan. Um, another part of another fun fact about Nubians is that we are about 5% of the Egyptian population today. So I call this one uh, the Nubians on Pinterest slide. Uh, these are images that usually portrays uh, Nubian people in Egypt today. Uh, we're usually people. We're usually portrayed as people who wear very colorful outfits, or we're always singing and dancing, um, which is kind of a tiresome stereotype that has a lot of subtle racisms in it. Uh, as if all we do is just dance and sing to entertain others. Uh, this is usually the kind of thing you'll see um, more in touristy areas and in the media. But as you can see here, this is how traditional people, uh, traditional Nubian people dress like. It's not as colorful as I've shown before. Uh, they dress in this traditional galabeas, which helps uh, with the harsh heat that we have. The women also um, dress in very light gowns, uh, which helps to cover their bodies from the harsh sun while also keeping them a little cool. So this is a brief summary of the uh, Nubian civilization timeline. Uh, 7,000 BC is the earliest known period of uh, the Nubian civilization, uh, but around that time, 
Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt had separate rulers. Uh, in 2250 BCE, um, Kerma was the start of the early Nubian civilization that has flourished from uh, 2250 to 1500 BCE. Uh, Kerma was the cultural hub uh, for the upcoming Nubian Empire. Uh, about 500 uh, years later, Kingdom of Kush rose into power. Uh, and then 203 years after that, the uh, Kingdom of Kush conquered Egypt with Pianchi as the crown of that pharaoh. And that's the picture that I showed earlier. Uh, these were the golden years of the Nubian civilization. Um, after that, we were conquered by a bunch of times, um, first by the Persians, then the Greeks, and followed by the Romans, and so on. Uh, skipping ahead to 1882, that's when the British rule began in Egypt. And by this time, Nubia was already um, part of Egypt, and the rule lasted until 1956. Four years after that was the last major event um, in that era, in that area, uh, which was uh, 1960 when the Aswan High Dam was built. This brings me to the next topic, which is the dam. Uh, the picture you see here is a, pi a picture of uh, Lake Nasser, which is now the lake that was formed by the creation of the dam. Uh, the dam started construction in 1960. Uh, the, project, the project was to build, uh, to create a reservoir which is now Lake Nasser. Uh, the dam was built out of necessity because there were like yearly floods and also to generate electricity. Yearly floods were both good and bad. Uh, the good part is that it brought many nutrients and minerals that enriched, um, enriched and made the soil more fertile. Uh, and that's mostly coming from the White Nile. Um, the bad part is that it brought low water years and created drought. This is a picture of where it is in the map. This dam resulted in the displacement of thousands of Nubians from their villages. Uh, as you can imagine, this was pretty devastating to the Nubian people. Um, they had to move to other part of Aswan that weren't as developed and they had to leave their land and houses behind. The Aswan Dam basically destroyed Nubian economic social and cultural life. Uh, there was a lot of government promises that weren't met or fulfilled, and Nubians were later forced to migrate up north to Cairo to find work. This was uh, one of the big projects of one of the few things that they had to move um, to avoid from drowning. Uh, this is the temple of Abu Simbel, which is uh, actually near the town where my family's from. Uh, the picture on the left is where it is now, and the picture on the right is when they were when they were moving it, the temple from its original place to avoid drowning. This is a, another one, another temple that had to be moved. Um, this is it here, like kind of drowning already. Uh, this is a temple called the uh, Fela Temple. And as you can see here, this is where it is now. And as you can see here at the bottom, like there's like a line. And this is like basic like water damage from uh, where it was before. So more about Nubian people. Uh, I wanted to show like the traditional Nubian house. This is the kind of traditional Nubian home, uh, which I think has some similarities to the temple that we saw before. Uh, the homes usually have an opening from the top in the middle so that the living room is basically like an open terrace. Um, this helps with the heat, and at night it keeps the house cooler because uh, Aswan has some of the highest, driest temperature in, in Egypt. Uh, Nubian homes, houses also are famous for their decorative doors. Uh, as you can he see here, they're usually like filled with symmetrical drawings and symbols and so on. And this leads me to the next part of the presentation, which is uh, who is Hamza al Din. Hamza's early life began in Tushka, where he was born in 1929. He lived there for most of his childhood. He then moved to Cairo as a teenager to study electrical engineer, and he worked on the Egyptian National Railroad. This is where the Tushka is right now. 
as I began playing uh, oud while studying in Cairo, uh, he heard about the construction of the dam uh, right before it started. Um, after learning about the effects of the dam, he changed directions from studying engineering to studying music. He then went to back to Aswan on a government grant to collect Nubian folk songs. Uh, he finished his education later from Cairo University and then went to the Ibrahim Shafiq uh, Institute of Music. And then he traveled to Italy to attend the Academy of Santa Cecilia to further his study in music. So what does Nubian music sound like? So to me, um, there's a couple of things that basically make music, make Nubian music Nubian. Uh, three elements are the musical instruments, the language, and the musical scale. The musical instruments. Uh, the oud is an essential instrument uh, in Nubian music. It's a double string instrument that's shaped like a pear and it's similar to the lute. The tar um, is the other essential instrument in uh, Nubian music. It's a percussive instrument that is uh, traditionally made with animal skin that is stretched out on a wide drum. Uh, the sound it creates is like a low end percussive sound that has a lot of bass and timber. The language. There are two uh, indigenous language developed in Nubia in written form. Uh, it's Merodic and uh, Old Nubian. Uh, there are several more that were developed, by, but only in speech form. Uh, but essentially in Nubian music, the Nubian dialect and the Arabic language are both used. The music scale. In Nubian music, the scale is usually, uh, this, that is usually used is uh, called the pentatonic scale. The scale can be played from any major scale by playing first, second, third, fifth, and sixth notes. Uh, if you play this scale starting on F sharp on the piano, the rest of the scale is black keys, which is the easiest way to describe it. But as you can see here, like if you play from C, it's C, D, E, and then G and A. So Hamza is a unique style. Um, I wanted to try this video because it's the simplest way of showing his unique style. Uh, this is a video of Hamza playing Oud where he lightly presses on certain strings of the hood to get this resonated sound and overtones that he's uh, really known well, known uh, well for. The song is based on some traditional farmer songs. And there are two different melodies and two different rhythms uh, attach it to each other to give you a whole picture of a new Nubian song. another video uh, I wanted to show where he plays the tar, uh, which is the other instrument that I was uh, speaking of earlier. This one is the only uh, Nubian instrument the Nubian have before I will introduce you to that. And uh, to play this instrument or this drum, there must be three drummers. 
because one is playing the uh, the bass, another one is playing the melody. And since I don't have another drummer, I will try to play boss by. And uh, I will do an old song used to be played with the seven. And this was the, the thing that was Hamza's known for uh, his oud playing and uh, being able to play all these over no overtones on oud uh, using resonance as notes while singing in Nubian language and also playing guitar. And this is how I know I'm listening to Hamza. Uh, this was a liner note from his uh, Water Wheel album, uh, which goes by just. Uh, Says, it says Hamza began to evolve uh, new musical forms by drawing the, the moods of colors of Nubian music into the vast technical aesthetic structure of um, Arabic classical music. Uh, this result is not a loose amalgamation of two variant forms of music, but an entirely new mode of expression. Uh, this is a very important um, point uh, because I feel like fusion of different sounds usually end up diluting one another at times. Uh, but in this wasn't the case here uh, with Hamza, and uh, that's essentially why like he was highly regarded. Uh, but to continue, uh, this is what is especially uh, significant in his full command of uh, technical possibilities of Daoud, combined with the new musical patterns and ideas growing out of the vocal music and drumming of traditional Nubia. This was written by Elizabeth Ferna. Uh, these are. Uh, most of his uh, album covers. As you can see here, the hood is almost in every uh, cover. And this is him playing with the Grateful Dead in uh, Cairo right before he moves to the United States. So, Hamza's legacy. Uh, to me, Hamza's legacy and experience as a, his experience as a Nubian forced to move with his family as a child is very significant to his work. Uh, before his death, he taught uh, ethnomusicology in several American universities, including the University of Ohio, the University of Washington, and the University of Texas, Austin. Which is, uh, sorry, University of Texas in Austin. He also went to Tokyo to make a comparative study between Naoud and uh, Japanese Biwa during the 1980s. And uh, it just appears to me that Hamza's mission was always to preserve Nubian music um, and heritage in his work by teaching it and spreading it uh, through his music. Nubian music today. So Mohammed Muir is one of the great examples of Nubian musicians that came after Hamza and is heavily influenced by him. Mohammed Muir's mentor Ahmad Muni was one of the greatest songwriters from Aswan at that time. Uh, he steered Muhammad Munir's talent uh, to more traditional side of Nubian music. Uh, Muhammad Munir later became a huge star in Egypt and by many is simply known as quote unquote king, not just the, not the king, just king. Um, Asara Nubitons. Asara Nubitons is also a great example of uh, Nubian music, uh, modern Nubian music, uh, and is the most current. Um, as a matter of fact, I learned about her the first time I did this presentation back in 2018, and I wanted to include her this time around because uh, she embodied all the characteristics of Nubian music in, uh, in a more modern and, form. And hopefully, I think she's coming on to the conversation series in January. Oh, that's awesome. Really? That's yeah. uh, great. Awesome. Yeah, I want to give a brief introduction about uh, Sara. Uh, she was known, uh, she was born in uh, Khartoum, Sudan, and is currently based in uh, Brooklyn, New York. Um, she formed her band, uh, Sara Nubatones, in 2010, released about two albums and a few EPs ever since. Um, they have a very rich sound that is focused on oud and percussions, along with more modern instruments like bass, guitar, and synth keys. I wanted to show this video of Hamam Nir. Uh, I particularly like this recording uh, for its minimalism and how true uh, it is to the roots of Nubian music. Uh, this is a recording session from Coke Studios by Hamam Nir. <laughs> Yeah. 
Um, going back to Hans's legacy, um, he sadly passed away in uh, May of uh, 2006 in Berkeley, California. He's survived by his wife, Nabra. Uh, to me, Hamza's mu- mission was just always to preserve Nubian music, uh, Nubian art and heritage in his work by teaching and spreading uh, Nubian culture through his music and uh, through his uh, teaching, of course. Thank you. This is my contact page, um, and here's my references. I also made the Spotify playlist of some of my favorite records by him, and I'll make sure to link that in the video. Okay, amazing. Um, Shadi, thanks so much. So there's a few, there's a few questions that you, um, that you kind of address that are worth bringing up. One about sort of the role of um, female singers um, in sort of traditional uh, traditional music and in Hamza uh, Dean's music, uh, you know, w- what's the? Did you come across anything about the the role of female vocalists? Definitely, um, and uh, there was definitely groups. Um, one of the most famous ones is uh, the um, Balebels, I believe they're they're called, uh, which is a trio uh, of three three um, uh, singers. So like the, the presence of female um, musicians have existed, it just wasn't, um, um, I guess just um, wasn't as much as, uh, as the male singers. Uh, and in Hamza's music, um, he used um, a lot of female singers as backup vocalists. As you can see in the, in the song, um, uh, Greetings, uh, there, was, there was like backup vocalists, yeah. yeah. Um, that's great. Um, a question about, um, you know, his role, um, as he, you know, he traveled around the world and when he was working in the Bay area, Mm -hmm. do you have a sense of, um, how his music sort of changed, um, you know, over the course of his career, you know, he like collaborated with Kronos Quartet and, you know, Grateful Dead um, he was exposed to all this music. He was a very worldly guy. He lived all over the world. Do you have a sense of how his music sort of changed over time? Um, not necessarily. I have a few of his records, and uh, they date from, um, like, from between, like, you know, the late '80s to the '90s. Uh, it just wasn't like there. Like, there's always like, um, obviously, there was a focus on the Nubian aspect of his music, but a lot of his music also. Uh, would cover like um, like Turkish music and Arabic music um, from the past and stuff like that. The the Nubian part, like there there was just always like one or two Nubian songs in there um, where he played the pentatonic scale and he played a, a folk like old folk uh, Nubian songs. But um, there were some albums that these were the focused and some albums weren't. Um, a lot of uh, his music. Um, ever since he came to America, um, was really popular in the, um, like, healing groups and stuff like that. Like, it's just kind of like, you know, hippie, um, meditative music. Um, so I guess he, like, started to make mu- make music that's more like that at some point. But, um, but, I, but, that, but, but that wasn't, like, a pattern um, that I've yeah. seen. That I've heard from from his records. Okay, two two uh, last questions. One about sort of um, if you've come across any English translations of his music, mm-hmm. um, and then the second one uh, is about him trying to you know um, how he merged the pentatonic scales and the makam. Yeah, yeah, um, right. Yeah. Um, I have. The only translation that I found um, was basically like in articles and stuff like that, mm-hmm. um, where they briefly translate one of the few things that, that he would say. Um, a lot of the Nubian songs that, like a lot of the Nubian uh, folk songs that he collected, uh, that later he covered in his albums, um, were just songs about like denial and stuff like that. So like. Um, and also, yeah, so like, uh, I, I can't remember where exactly were, were any of these translations 
um, but they existed. Uh, the as far as like the pentatonic as like mixing that with the macam, um, I don't think they mixed it as like that much. I think there was separate like there there were separate songs that he would make that were more focused on the macam, and there were more other songs that were more focused with um with the pentatonic. Um, maybe every now and then he would do that, but I have no idea how he did it. It was um. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Perfectly honest. Um, well, uh, thanks so much. This was awesome. This is super, thanks super fun. Um, Thank you. Thanks for having me. So if anyone wants to check out um, some of the references, they can go to africa.com slash library. You can find all this information there. Um, and do you want to just pull up your contact slide just one last time? Uh, yeah. This is it here. Yeah. So if you want to reach out to Shadi, that's the best way to um, reach out to him. Thanks, Shadi. This was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And I can't wait to uh, the Al-Sadar uh, presentation. Yeah. It should, man, it's so cool. She follows us on Instagram and I was nerding out awesome. and I was like, hey, <laughs> well, I'm a huge fan. Sweet. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, awesome. All right. Well, thanks, man. All right.